You're smiling because I said explode in your face, aren't you? I, I was going to take the high road. I was just going to smile <laughs> you, no, and No, your it go. smirk was not taking the high road. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Nerds You're Looking For podcast, a weekly nerd culture podcast that discusses nerddom through various segments. My name's Tyler Hunt, alongside my co-host as always, Pat Kuhn. How's it going, man? It's going pretty well. I know we complained about this last week, but it's only gotten worse. We're basically living in fucking water worlds right now. <laughs> it's crazy. I know. I The sun was out when I drove over here, and it was like the first time I've seen the sun in a week, it feels like. Yeah, it's kind of embarrassing. I mean, I don't really care, honestly, but um, it was just kind of funny. So I don't own a rain jacket. It's just not something yeah, no. that I own because it's... Neither I mean, do I. I no. Yeah, I mean, it's it's weird. I just don't go outside when it rains. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's my solution. But I, I brought it up uh, last week. I do have to go outside a little bit for my job now. And it's been raining pretty much nonstop for the last three days. And uh, so I had to borrow my wife's rain jacket yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and it's... Uh, not the most flattering thing on me. Uh, it's not necessarily a woman's coat, but it's definitely not a man's coat. So it's a woman's coat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's uh, very skinny. Uh, it's very awkward on me. It definitely looks uh, very, very odd on me. But, I mean, I don't care. A driver made a comment one time uh, yesterday. <laughs> I was just kind of laughed and then I just didn't really respond to it about like how pretty you looked or uh no i mean because that would have been super weird <laughs> that would have been the entire intro telling <laughs> everyone how creeped out about i was about this guy oh no i do have a story about that but uh hold on one second <laughs> about how pretty you look or that guy uh, oh no um so i'm just gonna tell the story okay please so this truck driver uh comes up to my window and I see his truck, and I mean, I see just a bunch of different kinds of tr uh, trunk, trucking companies, and his trucking company was called Big Stallion Trucking. Nice. And I don't know what came over me at the time, because I'm usually pretty just like, I want this conversation to be over as quickly as possible, <laughs> so I just tell you the information that you need to know, and I get you the fuck out of there. And it's the same way when they're checking out as well. I'm just – you sign your paperwork, and we do – what we got to do. Uh, but I walked out there and we were just kind of chit chatting while I was walking out there with him. And he was a fairly cool guy. So I was like, Hey man, have you ever asked the ladies if they ever want to ride on the big stallion? <laughs> oh, why would you <laughs> do he, that? <laughs> and he kind of looked at me and he laughed and he goes, yeah. And dudes. Oh no. <laughs> so I was like, all right. I got, I, I said, Oh no. And I should clarify that there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But it makes it sound like maybe he wanted you to take a ride on the big yes, stallion. Yes, that, that is uh, what I inferred as well. <laughs> I was like, ooh, I regret this. <laughs> Which, did again, shoot, did he nothing wrong with wink? it. Uh, no, I – well, he may have, but after he said it, I immediately like looked at the ground and didn't make eye contact with him again. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the conversation uh, took a turn for the worse. As far as I'm concerned, not, not again, not that there's anything wrong with no, that. No, good for him, man. Yeah. Just, uh... So... Yeah, it got, wow. it got really weird. <laughs> and oh, this is... intro got really no, weird. <laughs> it's so unlike you to... Like, cause I, I mean, I've known you for a long time and you, you are usually like that. Like, you just shut down conversations if it's something you're not interested in talking about uh, you could say sure. it i'm just a dick no but like i, I can imagine like i worked with you for a while and i can imagine how you are with these truck drivers and i that is a weird thing for you to say i mean i'm kind of curious what kind of mindset you were in that day where you i don't know it was just it guy. was towards the end of my shift and the guy was kind of chit-chatting with me and he was somewhat cool and so i was just like whatever i'll just make a joke and see in my world like, it, no matter what mood I'm in, if the guy names his trucking company or names his truck or whatever it is, the Big Stallion, I'm like, I don't want to have a conversation with you, <laughs> and I don't want to talk about the name of your trucking company. Uh, speaking of that, uh, I did 
and I, I almost posted this to my own personal Facebook, but I forgot about it. Um, I saw the trashiest tattoo I've ever seen in my entire life. In Evansville, I'm assuming, because... Yes, well, it was a truck driver in Evansville. Perfect. It was uh, on his arm, which is great, so everybody can see it. <laughs> uh, it was a just like the top half of a naked woman. Okay. With... Uh, a confederate flag like draped over her. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> it that was would, literally the trashiest tattoo I've would. ever seen in. Yeah, it was uh I mean it was well done. I could tell what it was, <laughs> but uh yeah, it was uh was pretty bad. Yeah. That. We did not chit chat. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't ask him about his tattoo or anything. No, or, I did not. Big, big stallions or No, cool. I did not. All right, so that kind of got off the rails real quick. <laughs> uh, normally, we start off each episode by kind of just checking in with each other. We call it what we're into. So what are you into this week? I finally got to see Colossal. Okay, cool. It was showing here in Evansville, and it, it's like it took long enough. It started showing all around the country, I believe, in March. But, of course, since we're kind of in the middle of the nowhere, of nowhere, it, it took a little bit to get to, to us, but it finally did. And I don't even know if it's still in theaters. It might have just lasted a week. I don't know. But either way, I did get to see it finally. Uh, if you don't know what Colossal is about, I believe it was shown at Sundance. And now it's making its rounds. It's about uh, a character named Gloria, who's played by Anne Hathaway. She's living with her boyfriend, who's played by Dan Stevens, who seems to be popping up and fucking everything all of a sudden. But um, they live in New York, and she's not working. Um, she's out of work, so she spends much of her free time partying and drinking with her friends, and it's getting a little out of hand. So they break up, and he kicks her out of the apartment. So she moves to, I believe, Maine, like at her, uh, her family summer home or something. She kind of moves back to, to the city she's from, and while she's there... She connects with an old acquaintance from high school that's played by Jason Sudeikis, and she starts working at his bar. About that same time, a giant creature starts attacking Seoul in South Korea, and it happens at the same time every day. And after about a week, Gloria starts to gradually, gradually realize that it's linked to her, and any movement that she makes is mimicked by the creature in Seoul. Um, so as you can tell um if you didn't know what it's about and that's just the first time you're hearing a synopsis it, it's a crazy movie um it, it could have easily been a spoof movie of like giant monster movies or kaiju movies but the writer director whose name is nacho vigilando he's made this movie that tells a really deep story about abuse control and kind of putting your life back together that's really kind of hits hard and it, and it's crazy because you you talk about what it's about and to be that deep emotionally you wouldn't expect it but it really is um it's most effective the least you know about it the less you know about it i guess uh so i'm not going to get into more of the plot but i will tell you that it's done very effectively uh the acting is great which is what you expect from somebody like ann hathaway you expect her to pick great projects and to leave it all out there because that's what she's done over her career but Jason Sudeikis, uh, in particular, is perfect in his role, and I've never seen him play a character like this. And I'm going to kind of leave it at that uh, and not get too much into his role because it kind of changes over the course of the movie. You can tell that um, Nacho, and I'm just going by his first name because it's fucking awesome that his name is Nacho. Um, you can tell that he put a lot of thought and care into this project because uh, it could have gone one or two ways, like I was saying. So I don't know that it's going to kind of connect with everyone that goes to see it on the same level, but just the originality um, with this movie and the way that it was pulled off so well, is it's definitely a must-see. Um, and I I don't know. I think it would probably be in my top 10 at the end of 2017. It was just it's too original to ignore. Yeah, I saw a trailer for this a while back. I don't remember because it, it is a very like indie, under the radar uh, type of movie. So I don't remember what movie I was seeing that I saw a trailer for. But I had mentioned to you that it looked really good and that it was in Evansville and that we should go see it. I just didn't get around to it. And I'm sure that it's already out of theaters because usually typically with these movies – they they come and they go pretty quickly. So it'll probably be something I'll have to catch on like video on demand or something like that. Yeah, and I'd imagine that a movie like that'll probably be on video on demand sometime this summer. They usually don't wait too long to get those out sure. there. So I was actually surprised because usually those types of movies are will do like a limited theor theatric release and then 
do video on demand kind of at the same time. So I was a little bit surprised that they didn't do something like that. Yeah, they could have probably found more success had they done that. And while it's kind of everybody's talking about it, had it easily accessible to everyone. So yeah. I'm surprised they didn't. But anyways, what are you into this week, dude? Well, I got two games earlier this week. I'm really going to kind of only talk about one in detail because I've only got to play the other one a little bit. Um, I got Little Nightmares on Xbox One. Uh, last year, we briefly talked, I think it was a nerd favor, about our favorite 2016 video game, and mine was Inside. And I bring that up because Little Nightmares is very, very similar to that game. Um, it's it's dark and gritty. It's like that 3D uh, platformer type of game. Fans of like, um, like just really subtle horror movies atmospheric kind of horror movies that that play a lot of with just tension and and soundtrack and that kind of stuff um we'll really like this game um, it's really detailed just like even down to the sound like the character the main character is her name is six she's just this little girl but she wears this big raincoat and like as you're running you can hear the raincoat kind of like uh, swishing or whatever you want to uh, call it and just like every little detail is, is really uh, meticulously done in this game so I'm really enjoying it so far I'm really really bad at it which is surprising because <laughs> I'm I'm actually pretty good at those type of puzzle platformer type of games um, so yeah I'm not great at it I put out the the first two let's plays in my walkthrough that I'm currently on and it's been kind of embarrassing that I'm putting that out in the world that I'm really not that bad at video games but I've, I've been playing it uh, pretty bad uh, so far but the game that I am actually going to talk about in a little bit more detail and it's kind of funny that I brought these two games up at the same time because the next game Little Nightmares is, is really dark and gritty and the next game that I'm going to talk about Mario Kart Eight Deluxe is like the most <laughs> colorful game that you could possibly have. I mean, it just kind of like explodes in your face with just color and just things going on. You're smiling because I like said explode in your face. Are you? I, I was gonna take the high road. I was just gonna <laughs> smile. No, and let your it go. smirk was not taking the high road. <laughs> I, I just I couldn't piece a joke together quick enough. If I'm being honest, but, uh... yeah, I. There's a couple of times where I felt like I was going to go in like an epileptic seizure playing Mario Kart because there's just so much going on. But uh, basically, if you don't know, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe is just Mario Kart 8 from the Wii U taken to the Switch. And they've given you all of the DLC from Mario Kart 8. They've also given you a couple of new racers and uh, some new battle modes. Um, I t talked about last week, or we talked about in our nerd favorite, our favorite Mario Kart racers. I uh, I have to admit, I misremembered. You actually can't play as Diddy Kong. Um, one of my favorite games of Mario Kart franchise is oh, Double Dash. Yeah. And I, that's the one that I played the most. And Double Dash, obviously, as the title would suggest, you have two racers. And I would always play as Donkey because Diddy was his partner. Yeah. So that's what I meant, just to clarify <laughs> that. Um, I kind of misremembered that you actually technically can't play as Diddy. You can only play as Donkey. That reminds me. Wasn't there a Diddy Kong Racing? Yes. Is, there was I, something like that. Yeah, it was like first, Donkey Kong Racing or something like that. Yeah. But you could play as Diddy. Yeah. I, I remember something. That. And maybe that had a little bit of uh, – maybe I was confusing it a little bit. But I've played – I played Mario Kart a lot as a kid, but most of it was on the GameCube with Double Dash, so that's what kind of confused me a little bit. Anyways, now that I've kind of gotten that out of the way, um, I've played this game the few times that I, I wasn't playing Little Nightmares, um, or the few times that I was not playing this game, I was playing um, Little Nightmares because I was, I was playing this just like any free moment that I had, I was playing this game, especially because the Switch makes it so easy. And I, I talked about this when it first came out, like the handheld mode and the tabletop mode. I've been playing the tabletop mode a lot because I just got uh, a pro controller and I really like the feel of that. And so I've been uh, kind of messing around with that. Um, so you have to play that either on the when it's docked or in uh, tabletop mode. So I've been playing that a lot. Uh, much like little nightmares this this game is, is super super detailed there's a ton of different tracks every track just because of the de design uh feels really really different i mean of course there's the different themes and that's going to make it 
different, but the des- actual design of the tracks uh, make them different. There's w- these ramps that kind of shoot you in the air and you fly for a little bit. And there's also ways that you can kind of like uh, drive up walls and do these different shortcuts. So every track just feels a lot different than the other one, despite the fact that there's also this other theme uh, to it. There's also, um, I mean, they, they've done this in, in past Mario Kart games, but, uh, there's different Grand Prix, but there's also, you could, there's basically just different levels, uh, different CCs is what they call it. Like you have 50, 100, 150, and 200. So even if you get really good at one track, you can bump up the CCs and it feels like a completely different race because you are going a lot faster. Um, so you get kind of get starting in the feel of the track and then you bump it up and they're like, okay, I, I'm good now and I can bump up. And then you almost have to l- relearn it because every track is different uh, depending on, on, on the CC. So I do find myself playing the time travels or time travels, time trials a lot, kind of trying to put the perfect score down on each track. Uh, I, I put a lot of time into that. The battle mode is fun. I'm not very good at it. It's, it's kind of chaotic. Um, but it's still really fun and it just kind of adds that extra replay value, uh, to the game. Last, but uh, unfortunately, I, I kind of have to talk a couple of negatives uh, with the game. I feel like there could be more characters because it's Nintendo. Yeah. I mean, you have Smash Brothers, and it has Smash Brothers has more games or more characters. So I don't see why they couldn't just put the Smash Brothers characters in Mario Kart. Like, how is that? Because you have, yeah. Don- oh, I guess technically Donkey Kong was part of the Mario franchise. So maybe they're just trying to, but there's some. So, uh, so, uh, what was that fucking game called? It's Platoon. There's yeah, some Platoon, yeah, Platoon. Uh, characters in Mario Kart now and Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. So, I mean, there's characters that aren't part of the Mario universe that are still in there. So, I, I don't know why they couldn't just put yeah, all not? of those Super Smash Brothers characters in there. So, you should be able to play as Diddy and you should be play, able to play. Oh, Link is in there too. Link is not part no, of Mario yeah. Kart at all. So, it's just like. Why don't you just put Kirby in there? All of them. Yeah, that'd be pretty awesome to be able to play as like Kirby and Link. Yeah, so I mean, you can as as Link. Link's oh, in Mario Link Kart. Is in Mario yes. Kart. Uh, so that was kind of my other argument to put all. I mean, you Thanks. already have Link in there. You might as well just put all like, of them. Throw in Throw Samus in there. Yeah, exactly. So you uh, you have all these other characters that I mean, it doesn't really affect like because we, we kind of mentioned it briefly when we talked about it last week. The racer doesn't really matter. It's really just your skill on the track and your skill at the game. There's not really an advantage or disadvantage to different characters. It's really just kind of picking your favorite character and just going with it. Um, Also, we kind of talked a little bit about this off air. The online multiplayer is really kind of shitty to get into. Like if let's say, well, I mean, first of all, just getting a game is, is, or getting a race in this particular case is, is kind of tedious. But then, like, if you were to jump on, like, if we were going to play on Halo on Xbox Live, like, I jump on, I start playing, and then you jump on later, I can just invite you to my party and invite you to my game, and you jump right in when we're on the loading screen. Mario Kart, it's not like that. Like, I can't invite you to my game. I would have to back out, and it's, it's like this whole other process. It's, it's super irritating. So this is the first big multiplayer game for the Switch. Because, yeah. I mean, in Zelda, you couldn't do anything with multiplayer. So um, this is the first big multiplayer game for the Switch. As far as I'm concerned, there was Bomberman, and there was the 1-2 Switch. But that, I mean, I never got those games. This is a big one for me. And uh, to have the multiplayer just not work as well, as I'm used to, because I'm a big Xbox guy. I'm used to it working a certain way. And I wouldn't even mind if it was a little bit different because it's Nintendo versus Xbox. I'm not saying that Xbox does everything perfect, but to have it going from a Xbox Live, which is super easy to, to do as far as multiplayer is concerned, to going to Nintendo where it's a fucking hassle to do um, is, is very disappointing. Yeah, I actually... I think I told you this when I got over to your house today, but uh, I probably, if any place had the stock or the switch in stock, I probably would have bought one just to play Mario Kart. I haven't played Mario Kart since Nintendo 64. Oh, so wow. I have not owned a Nintendo system since the Nintendo 64. So it's hard to believe that there's been eight of them 
And I've so what is the one for sixty four considered Mario Kart two? Since the first one was on Super Nintendo, yes, I, I would. I th- believe that is the second one. So I'm I'm missing like you know five or six Mario Karts somewhere yeah. in there. So I, it's definitely a something I want to get back into, and I definitely want to get back into the Nintendo side of things for whenever the eventual Super Smash Brothers game comes out. But uh, I'll probably hold off a little bit longer. But I do foresee myself eventually getting a Switch. It just occurred to me the other day. Um, I own every Nintendo system since the Super Nintendo now. Oh, yeah. You were just showing me that you your wife brought her Super Nintendo from from her parents' house. So so you have, yeah, because you just bought a 64, right? Yeah. And you already had a GameCube. Yep. And then what was after GameCube? The Wii U? Wii. Wii. Wii U. I didn't know you had a, a original Wii. Yes, uh, we have. It's at... It's at my wife's sister's house or her mom's um, house. Or something. They're just borrowing because gotcha. they do the Wii Fit. That's I mean, cool. so it's technically ours, but <laughs> it's not here currently. But any uh, Wii game you can play on the Wii U anyway. So that we, at the time, we were just like, well, we have this Wii U now. There's no real, real sense to keep in the Wii. Um, we didn't sell it, like I said, the, it's just being stored somewhere else. But yeah, yeah I have a. Every Nintendo system since Super Nintendo now. That's awesome. Do you think you'll get um, a regular Nintendo, like the Nintendo Classic? See, I, I've been kind of going back and forth about the Nintendo Classic. First of all, I don't have it. I wanted to get one, uh, but they sold out super, super quick, yeah. and now they're discontinued. So the price is only going to go up on that. And to be honest with you, you can only play 30 games on it. So I'm considering just getting uh, a regular Nintendo, yeah. You play, you run the risk of it being shitty and yep. it eventually crapping out because it's such an old system. And then the cartridge is the same. Um, you just kind of run the risk of it crapping out. But the fact that if I buy this, basically, I'd have to pay more for the classic at this point because I'd have to get it off of eBay, and they're going for like 150, 200 bucks on eBay. I'd pay less than that to get an an original Nintendo plus, I mean, yeah, I'd have to pay for the cartridges and stuff like that, but I would rather pay for the nostalgia to have the actual console and have being able to buy the games that I want to play, not just 30. Now I know that some of the ones that are selling on eBay have been modded so they could, uh, play like 600 games or something Mm -hmm. crazy like that um so people have been able to do that so it's only a matter of time before people figure out how they put even more games on it but uh i just i don't want to run the risk of not being able to play a game that i want to play it's like oh i have a a nintendo system sort of because i can't go buy out i can't go out and get a cartridge or something or yeah i mean with the collection you have i feel like you just got to finish it out and get a the actual console. Yeah. I'm just going to be like the little devil on your shoulder telling you to, <laughs> to, to spend the money. No, I mean, I'm eventually going to get something like Nintendo something, like whether it's a, a classic or if it's the actual console, I'll definitely finish it out. My next big purchase is a PlayStation 4, though. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> you just have gone balls deep with this gaming thing. Yeah, well, I mean, I was always a big gamer, um, but just yeah. recently I've been – because I, I was always just kind of like, oh, well, I just want to play the most recent games. Like I, I've, But there's so many different titles that come out every month, and it's just like I don't have time to play all of them. So it's like there's so many games that I missed that I should just go back and, and play. For sure. So I've been doing more of that recently and playing a lot more retro games than I, I normally would because I've usually just, for the last couple of years, I've just been picking up the big ones like Halo and Madden and I pick up three or four games a year. I've bought, like, already this year just brand new games, not just me going back and, and buying retro games or whatever. I've already bought, like, seven brand new games this year, which is more than I thought. I think I bought all of last year, so I'm definitely getting more into it no that's awesome man more power to you i wish that i i don't i wish i had the time i don't i don't know that i feel like i would have to start choosing between things um and i'm so into like watching the movies and the tv shows but i still do all of that stuff yeah. too it's just i i don't know i probably sacrifice i don't i i had to i have to be sacrificing something <laughs> uh because probably there's just only... time with your wife yeah but i mean 
she has her own things yeah, too. No, so it, no, 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 I, I understand, but it's just like she has her own things too. And so when she's watching The Voice or something else, like I'll just go into my room and and play my games. And so I mean, it doesn't feel like I'm sacrificing anything. Um, but I mean, I, obviously I am. There's there's got to be something there uh, that I'm not thinking about. I haven't been doing stand up as much as I I have been in the past, but I've had a couple of rough shows, and I think that's a little bit more to do with oh, the yeah. fact that I haven't uh, been doing it as much. But uh, yeah, I've just been really really into it lately. Cool, man. That's awesome. All right, so our next segment is just plainly called Comics. Tal and I read a ton of comics each week, and we like to spotlight one or two each week. So what would you read this episode? I read this week uh, a new comic that just started called Bane Conquest. Yeah, I heard about that. It's, so Bane Conquest number one. I was intrigued by this book. It's normally a, It would normally be a book I honestly wouldn't really think twice about, but it was being done by Chuck Dixon and Graham Nolan, who are two of the creators of Bane and were involved with like the Nightfall stuff. So that really piqued my interest because I always, anytime like a creator comes back to the story and the characters that they helped develop and create, it feels like a homecoming of sorts. So I was excited to see what story they had thought up that was good enough to bring them back to this character. Unfortunately, I'm not exactly sure that this first issue, um, is a good indication of where it's going. It's it's really pretty weak. Yeah, I had um, heard that it was kind of bad. That's why I didn't un- retroactively go back and pick it up. Yeah, so for what it's worth, this is going to be a 12-issue um, miniseries. And this story starts out with Bane and his cronies intercepting a ship that's headed for Gotham. What's weird is that you don't find out it's Gotham until later on. Uh, Bane just refers to it as his city. So whenever you hear Bane say you know, this is coming for my city. I immediately think of like, Oh, so Santa Prisa or like the, where he was raised in the prison. Um, and then, you know, you find out later it's Gotham and it doesn't really make much sense to me. So basically there's a ton of weaponry on this boat that's headed and he makes a claim that there's so much, um, weaponry on this ship that it's not for street sale. It has to be to, for some kind of war in Gotham and the rest of the book basically follows Bane as he's going around roughing people up to, to get Intel to save once again and quotes his city. And it, you know, he's kind of playing the part of Batman, like, you know, going around doing detective work, beating the shit out of people to, to get the info he wants. And none of it feels right for the character. Um, there's never any motivation that's set up in this entire issue. And you never empathize with the character at all because it, you just, go right into it and, and nothing's ever explained. Um, there's no reason to care about what you're reading or where the story is headed. And I feel like, especially in a mini series where you've confined yourself to a certain amount of issues, you need to, and especially when it's about a villain, you kind of have to set your intentions up and make you care about a character that you're usually rooting against. And they don't do it in this. Um, I will say that Graham Nolan's art is great. So it does have that going for it. But, you know, I told myself going into it, like, this is a 12 issue miniseries that I'd love. I'm going to hang with it um, no matter no matter what. It's just 12 issues. I can I can knock that out and commit to that. But after this first issue, I just I don't think I'm going to keep going. It it I, it didn't pique my interest at all. It, after about halfway through the book, it started to feel like homework. That, and I don't want my comic reading to be like that. So, yeah, for sure. I always get really nervous that. Am I reading this book because I'm enjoying it or am I reading it because I feel like I have to? Yeah, exactly. And that's 100% how I felt when I was done with this issue. So, yeah, it might only be a commitment of 12 issues, but, you know, that's also if it's once monthly, that's a year. Or, and if yeah. it's twice monthly, that's. And you if know. you think about it, if, well, DC has been trying to do the two ninety nine recently, but it's yeah. still three bucks. I mean, I mean that's what. Yeah. something like that yeah something around there like and again this is not even a comic i would have been interested in had i not known that the creators of the character were involved so you know just because they created the characters maybe there's a reason that they haven't been writing the character all along so i don't know it's 36 i don't know why 
Is it thirty six dollars? Or oh, are we still down there? Yeah, <laughs> we still so, I really, it really bothers me <laughs> that I don't know. I have two bachelor's degrees and I can't do simple math. <laughs> it's it's thirty six. Okay. In either way, it's thirty six dollars <laughs> that I could I could spend on something else. So um yeah, I, I don't think I'm gonna keep going with it. All right. So um Normally, like to segue into this this segment, I always say, "Oh, Tyler and I read a ton of comics each week." Other than this week, I I did not <laughs> read a, a ton of comics this week. I actually uh, kind of behind the scenes, I do a lot of let's plays on our YouTube channel. You should definitely check that out. But this week, the games that I talked about and what I'm into, unfortunately, for whatever reason, Amazon uh, really kind of screwed me this time around. Normally. Because I have Amazon Prime, I get it the day it comes out. I'm still complaining about I it. What? I was like, this is like the third episode in a row you bitch <laughs> yeah. about Amazon Prime. Yeah, I, uh, I'm I'm still pretty bitter about it. But uh, basically, what what I do is I I always try to like play ahead. So if you're seeing a video on Tuesday, chances are I did it like last week. Uh, I always try to stay ahead because I do have a job that I go to <laughs> and I do other things that um. I, I do also enjoy. So, um, I have to kind of stay ahead. That's just the only way I can keep up with it. Anyways, unfortunately, because it was delayed, it kind of threw my whole schedule off. So most of this week I was literally, so if you're watching the video on Thursday, chances are I did it on Wednesday. Like that's <laughs> like, it was a pretty quick turnaround this week. Uh, so I found myself, uh, Unable to go to the comic book shop. I was really, really busy with work and uh, doing the YouTube stuff. So, unfortunately, I didn't really – I didn't even go to the shop today or uh, this week, and I really didn't have a whole lot of time to read comics. But luckily, because I do read a ton each week, there was one that I wanted to bring up a couple of weeks ago that I just – Something else came out, and I just it kind of overshadowed it. It's a a Boom Studios comic, so it's definitely an indie comic uh, called God Shaper. Okay, have you ever even heard of this? No. Uh, basically, uh. what it's about, like I said, it's it's a Boom Studios book, which they typically most of what I read from them is like movie adaptations. They do a lot of movie adaptation adaptations, and uh, I usually kind of enjoy them because they. I usually just find the the movies that I really like, like Planet of the Apes or Escape from New York and, and that kind of stuff. And it's it's more kind of additional reading uh, for people that really love those movies. But I kind of wanted to give their original property a try, just to like just one book that is an original story that they do. It's also just – it's kind of a, a weird – concept so as much as i like marvel and dc i mean i love superheroes obviously that's a big part of what we talk about each week it's nice to kind of have a book that's not that yeah it's kind of a palate cleanser a little bit uh basically what this book is about uh the world that these people live in every Everybody's born with their own personal god that kind of just follows them around and that's has its own like powers except for a certain group of people and they're like one in a thousand or something. I can't remember the exact number that they said in the book and they're called shapers. Basically they don't have their own God, but they can like basically control other people's gods and they're kind of frowned upon. They're kind of like second class citizens. And uh, one the main character in this comic book is a shaper. And he basically makes his living by going town to town and basically just doing maintenance on other people's gods. Like if they like break down or something, they almost kind of treat them like they're almost like robots. Like they need to be like serviced every once in a while really? or they get like senile or something. So he kind of basically that's how he makes his living is going around. Uh, town to town and kind of just doing maintenance on all these uh, gods and the concept is really cool they throw they do throw a lot at you at this in this first issue but not a ton happens as far as the plot's concerned you really just kind of learning what's going on in the universe and kind of learning the rules of this new world that they're building which makes sense because it is kind of a high concept but I still want more. Like, I don't know. It just, it felt like they were just feeding me a lot of exposition, which they were. And I do kind of understand uh, with a number one, like I said, it is a pretty high concept, but 
I want a little bit more plot than they gave uh, gave me in this particular book. No, it sounds super interesting. And, and like you, I think as, much, as sad as it is to say, the comics I look forward to reading the most are the ones that are a deviation from the superhero things. Sure. Like you said, it's definitely a palate cleanser. I always get a little self-conscious and this is dumb. Whenever I go to the comic book store and I pick up a bunch of titles and it's like all Marvel and DC. Yeah. I'm like, man, they probably think I'm just a poser. Yeah. So it, it, it is nice to have like the things I sprinkle in between the superhero things like she wolf and reborn and uh, sure. some of the others. So this one definitely sounds interesting. I honestly don't know that I've ever read anything by boom. Really? Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure that I have, so I'll have to look into it cuz it sounds like a cool premise if they like you said maybe get past the exposition that they had in the first issue. So, yeah, maybe I'll wait and so, see what you think about the second. Oh yeah, I'm definitely going to stick with it and if you are listening and you're kind of looking for something that's a little out of the ordinary, uh, I definitely suggest it. I haven't and I didn't write this down, and I should have. The creative team is a pretty well-known creative team and i never read anything from them and i'm i'm blanking on their names uh but so i mean it's it definitely has some talent behind it and i'm definitely looking forward to to seeing kind of where they take it cool all right so you ready for some nerd news yeah so every week we talk about the big nerd headlines that have come up since the last time we spoke um it wasn't too bad of a week but it wasn't as good as last week so we'll just get into it this first one I don't know if you probably don't even care about it, but it's for me. So uh, they're making the live action Lion King movie. Yep. And or I guess not really live action, but you get Jungle, yeah. Jungle Book esque. Sure. Uh, John Favreau's making it. And the whole time, like the, they've cast Mufasa, they've cast him. I believe we talked about it. Uh, Donald Glover's playing Simba. James Earl Jones is coming back for Mufasa. Um, the biggest casting question I had was who's going to play Timon and Pumbaa. And, okay. And they came. Uh, it, there's. They're in talks with some actors that are going to probably play the characters. And uh, Timon is most likely going to be played by Billy Eichner. Yep. And Pumbaa is going to be played by self Seth Rogen. I like Seth Rogen. I'm not a huge Billy on the street fan. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's fun what he does, but it's really just him yelling at strangers. It gets yeah. old pretty quickly. No, I don't like Billy on the street, but I mean, he was okay in Parks and Rec. And I yeah. th- he has like the, the voice and the demeanor for Timon. Oh, yeah. Uh, my whole thing is I don't see those two singing at all. Like, I don't, I don't see them being good singers, especially Seth Rogen. So I'll be interested to see how they do like Hakuna Matata. But, uh, yeah, I I thought that was pretty decent casting. So, uh, yeah, I like the Seth Rogen. Yeah, I mean, it kind of makes perfect sense. Not, not that he, I don't want to like disparage him. Like, yeah, he's kind of a warthog, but he's got like, <laughs> he's got, like that deep voice and sure, kind of a, a good I, guy. I so, didn't think that at all. <laughs> <laughs> but if he's listening, I want him to know that I, I'm. A oh, fan. he's for sure. Listening. Oh, yeah. yeah. If yeah. If he made he it past the big guy and stuff. one of our tweets one time. <laughs> oh, fuck. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so he, he listens for oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I forgot about that. That's yeah. All right. The next one is a trailer. And I know for sure that you saw it because uh, you were posting on our Facebook about it. Um, the dark trailer or nope, not, not that dark tower trailer. Yeah, I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> the dark tower trailer was released this week. And I actually just watched it before I came over to start recording. I didn't even watch it the day it came out. Um, I read a couple of your comments that you were going back and forth with Matt from the obsessive viewer. I didn't read your guys' whole conversation, but um, you were underwhelmed, weren't you? Yeah, I don't know. Like I was telling Matt when we were going back and forth, it just seemed weird to me. Like I've only read the first book. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, obviously there's eight books, so I've only gotten one eighth of the story. So there's, there's so much that I don't know. So I never wanted to come across as like this expert in it. He is most certainly, I know he's, he's read all the books and I think he's read, reread them. Um, so he's definitely m- much more of a Dark Tower fanboy than I am. I was underwhelmed by the first book, to be completely honest with you. And I think I mentioned it uh, one time on what I was into when I was first getting into audiobooks. I think I mentioned it. But um, I just – it didn't – I don't know. The, the action looked kind of cheesy to me. Um, it just wasn't what I expected. And I know – that it's kind of a, a combination of a lot of different parts of 
the different books. And I, I kind of mentioned it to him when we were talking that if it was the first book, that first book would be very, very boring movie. Like there's not a, a yeah. ton that happens in the first book. The first book definitely sets some stuff up. There's some action scenes here and there. And there's one in particular that I would really hope that's in that in the Dark Tower movie because it's really, really cool. But uh, other than that, that's really the only big action piece in the whole book. So it would be a really boring movie if that was it just covered that first book. So there's definitely a lot of stuff that I don't understand, but just what I know of the characters, they seem to have taken a lot of liberties. Really? It just seems a little weird to me. And I just overall was underwhelmed by the trailer itself. I plan on reading The Gunslinger before this comes out. Don't I, expect much. Yeah, I mean, I I bought it so I, <laughs> at one point, so I, I got to read it. But uh I don't know. I, w- I was kind of in the same boat with the trailer and I'm coming in with even less knowledge than you. Cause I've never read any of the books, but I am a huge Stephen King fan and I don't know. It, it definitely looked different than I expected. And I don't know. I was really pumped for this movie, but I mean, well, of course we're going to review it. We'll still see it. I just, my expectations have been uh, lowered a little. So for sure, we'll see. Uh, let's see. There was also a trailer released the same day for The Defenders, which is going to premiere on Netflix August 18th. And did you watch that? I, I feel weird because you said it got released on the same day. I watched the Dark Tra- Tower trailer like immediately <laughs> did not get around to seeing The Defenders. Yeah, Iron Fist kind of, I think maybe uh, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so I I liked the trailer. It doesn't tell you a lot about what's going on. It's more just like, you know, them coming together and a couple scenes with them. And there's this, it ends with this really dope fight scene that's going to take place in a hallway, which we imagine can, that. Yeah, exactly. But it, it looks really cool. Um, that being said, and one, another good thing about it, there is some levity, which is something that you and I have kept saying as we review these shows is there needs to be more humor, uh, especially with um, Iron Fist. We were expecting a lot more humor there and there wasn't any. Uh, it looks like there's a lot of banter between the characters that is going to bring that levity to the show that we've been wanting. Maybe not as much as we'd expect, but still a little bit. That being said, Dude, I just I can't get past Finn Jones. He is to me such a poor actor. And anytime he talks in this trailer, I just I cringe a little bit and I feel awful saying that because the rest of them are so good and I love all the other Netflix shows and I don't want that one fourth of the team to ruin it for me, but maybe he'll get kind of lost in the ensemble cast. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully the others uh, Which is a shame to say because I really like that character a lot. Yeah, hopefully they they raise raise him up instead yeah. of show how poor he is. But um, yeah, that that'll be out August eighteenth, and I'm sure we'll review it close to that. Of course, date. yeah. So uh, let's see. Did you see the picture of the Inhumans? Yes. Okay. So the Inhumans are a group from Marvel Comics that I'm not honestly that familiar about. Like the most I've know about the Inhumans is what happened in Civil War two. So. I know you've read more of the Inhuman stuff. I'm curious what your thoughts on this TV show are. I like the original Inhumans. I don't really like what they're doing in the comic book right now. I like Black Bolt. Medusa's all right. Lockjaw. I I mean, I love dogs, so I think that's cool as shit. But uh, I love the idea of a superhero not being able to really talk. So I think that's going to be interesting to see how they do a TV show where one of the main characters doesn't talk at all. Because if he talks, you basically die because his voice is that strong. Um, so I'm definitely interested to seeing to see how they do that and see if that actor can carry that. Yeah. Because that's that's definitely going to be a tough performance to pull off. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing Lockjaw. Just like I said, I'm, I'm a huge dog lover. So I'm definitely interested in that. Like I said, I really don't like what they're doing with the Inhumans in the comics because because of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the the kind of the battle between them and Fox right now that has bled over a little bit more than a little bit into the comics and so they're kind of not really phasing out the X-Men but they're definitely not as prominent as they used to be. And they're kind of building up the Inhumans yeah. because basically if you think about it, the Inhumans 
are not that much different from X-Men. It's just you gave them a different name and basically a different backstory. But a lot of the newer Inhumans are basically just mutants. They, mm-hmm. they don't call them mutants. They just call them Inhumans. So as far as that picture that they released goes, do you think that they did the characters justice? The woman that's playing Medusa looks weird to me. I don't yeah. know what it is about her. That I, I just, I don't know. I don't know that it's her. It's her fucking hair, man. I, well, that's how Medusa is in the but it comics. Looks, but it's so obviously a wig. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't know how you get around that because, of course, it is a wig. But I don't know. I don't like it. But in, anyway, I am excited for this show. Uh, as I didn't, I, I didn't stick with Agents of Shield. I will. I mean, I'm going to try to stick with this show when it when it comes on. But we'll see. I, like I said, I don't know much about the characters, so I'm I'm kind of my interest is peaked. For sure. All right. Last thing is really simple, and I just wanted to throw it out there because it it broke today. But Comic Book Men has been renewed for a season seven. Oh, I did not know that. So, have you kept up with that show over the years? No, I, I think I I went till maybe season four and i mean it's it's fun i like the characters that are in the show but it's it's pretty obvious that it's staged just like yeah. any other reality show yeah. i mean i like that it's comic books but it's gotten f- i think further away from comic books and more about like oh each episode we have to have this weird like stunt or we're gonna go to this flea market or we're gonna have this contest or and I get it; it's a TV show, but I also just want them to talk about comic books more. Yeah, they got they got away from that a little bit in season six, like the whole like, oh, well, we're gonna do a comedy show with the stash, and like yeah. that, that obviously stage stuff. But what I don't like is, you know, you do seven year, or six years of a show, and they're going into the seventh. You have to get more and more. They probably feel like they have to get more and more obscure, and they're talking about stuff that I don't know about and don't care about and comics that I don't care about. And, you know, what's the, like, I want them to bring in like cool issues of comics and they feel like they have to touch on every piece of pop culture. So it's, it has gotten away from that, but I do like, I think that they, they work well together. Obviously they are coworkers and friends in real life. So they have a funny banter and Kevin Smith is of course great on it, but I will admit, like you said, that it's kind of gotten away from, I think what it sought out to do at the beginning. So I'm, I am excited that a show like this has gone on seven years though. Um, and that for sure, those guys have had success and Mike and Ming are going to be at, um, Indie Indie, popcorn yep. this summer where we will also be. So that'd be cool, but that's for it. sure. That's all I got for nerd news. All right. So our next segment is just plainly called our main topic. It changes from episode to episode. Obviously the big movie that came out this week is guardians of the galaxy volume two which was written and directed by James Gunn, which, of course, it's a follow-up to the massive hit uh, from 2014, right? This came out in 2014, I, I do yeah, believe. That, that sounds right. Yeah, so Volume 2 follows, of course, the Guardians making a name for themselves after the events of the first film as they are hired for a job that goes terribly wrong. Most think, or most like, or most... Uh, I can't even remember how I was going to word it. Basically, thanks to Rocket. It went horribly wrong <laughs> because of Rocket. I don't know why I had to get all weird about it. Anyways, however, they are bailed out by a stranger that happens to have insight into Peter, a.k.a. Star-Lord's heritage. So, obviously, Tyler and I were very excited for for this film. It was one of my favorites from 2014. We're just going to go for it. I, okay. I'm almost positive it was 2014. It was. It was. Um, I don't exactly remember where it fell on that list, but I, I guarantee you it was on that list. Um, sequels, however, do make me somewhat nervous. I doubt that it was going to be as fun as and as fresh as the original because the original just kind of came out of no, and then come out of nowhere because we knew years ahead of time that they were going to do this movie. But I didn't know what that movie was going to be. I yeah. hoped it was going to be what it ultimately ended up being, but you just never know. Yeah. Um, and it's, that's really hard to replicate that type of comedy. Um, perfect example for me is just Ghostbusters 2. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's that same type of comedy in Ghostbusters that is in Guardians, and then you just, it's so hard to replicate it. Even if you have that same creative team, it's still really hard to uh, replicate that. Um, 
And it's I think it's even more amazing what they did with Guardians. Because for those that don't read the comics, Guardians of the Galaxy is really not that big of a property. It was just because Marvel wanted to expand the cinematic universe and there's only so many characters that they actually own the movie rights to. Uh, so they basically made the Space Avengers and that's yeah. what the Guardians are. But they're really not that big of a uh, property as far as the comics are concerned. I actually, before Guardians 1 came out, um, I started reading the comic book and it's actually – it's not bad by any means, but it's not the same as the movie. Yeah. Like even in the comics, the group dynamic is a little bit different and it's not as fun and, and as fresh as, as the movie is. So even that Guardians is a little bit different. So a- after Secret Wars, I actually dropped it. I mean, really? it's a, it's a good book, but, um, it's not the, the, the ga- Guardians that I want to see. So, um, yeah. I, for me, I remember exactly where, the first guardians ended on my 2014 best of list. And that was number one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's through the years, even after civil war guardians of the galaxy has been my favorite, uh, MCU movie. Uh, I just, I fell in love with the characters. I fell in love with, um, James Gunn's storytelling. And I was a fan of his before guardians. I love slither. I think yeah. that's a really underrated movie. And of course he wrote Dawn of the dead, uh, the remake, which is great. So seeing him, he wrote kinda, the he, Balco experiment too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is how, uh, man, his brother has got to be thinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thinking. Hey, <whatever. laughs> he was in Gilmore Girls. I, I know. I didn't realize that until I started digging into like IMDb last night. I'm like, oh, so he did get a job um, that wasn't involved with his brother. But uh, yeah. Anyways, uh, the first Guardian has just, just been one of my favorites. So I obviously was anticipating this quite a bit and was really excited for it. So we break down our reviews into different segments, and the first segment is obviously just going to be like a general overview. Uh, we call it broad strokes. When we uh, and I've talked about this before in the past, when we review movies, I try to uh, stay away from any kind of reviews. But this is one of our Rotten Tomatoes movies, so I did kind of peek at it occasionally. <laughs> the last time I checked, it was at eighty three percent, which honestly, that's that's really low for me for a Guardians movie. Like, and I did click on a few. Like, I I didn't click on the actual review, but I just did scroll through a few. And I mean, I understand with a sequel, you almost have to compare it to the original. And I'm sure we're going to do that through the course of this review. But I just feel like comparing it to a movie that just kind of blew everybody out of the water is a little unfair. The first film is always going to be my favorite no matter what. Like if they make six more of these movies and they're all really good, the first one's always going to be my favorite because I came in with – I mean I had expectations for it. It's not like this unknown indie movie that I didn't really know anything about. But uh like I said, I, I came into it with modest expectations and it just completely blew me away. It's just so much fun, and it's probably one of the the funnest movie going experiences I've ever had. The first one, going to see the first one, um, this particular theater experience, seeing Volume Two, wasn't quite the experience, just because I had ex- much more expectations going in. I knew what this movie was going to be uh, going in, but I think in a vacuum this is actually the better of the two movies. It's not my favorite. Yeah. It's, I think it's the better of the two movies. And I say that, and obviously we'll go into more detail as we break it more and more down. But, um, it's, it's, it's weird to say that this is more character driven because the first one is definitely a character study for sure. But I think that this one, I mean, they're both character driven but i really enjoy the way that these characters are written in this movie and how they have evolved from the second movie because if you think about it um they're just i mean they don't really know each other they're strangers that kind of come together in the first movie and so there's a lot of kind of infighting in this movie and it makes sense because 
these are there's kind of they're all abrasive personalities and so they they kind of clash uh with each other so i really liked how the characters evolved from the first movie um one flaw with the first movie one of the big flaws kind of with most of the marvel cinematic universe is they have sometimes have weak villains in the first guardians that's the biggest flaw that i can find with that movie oh, is the, vi- the villain is really weak um because i mean they're obviously building up to Thanos. So every villain that's going to come across is not going to be Thanos. So um, it, that villain's not going to last very long. Um, Ro- Ronan's really not developed hardly at all in the first film. And he's dispatched pretty easily at the end, actually. Um, the villain in this movie felt so much more important than the first m- villain. A hundred percent. I, I agree with that quite a bit. And I actually had the same thought was that as much as I like, love the first one, it was more about them coming together than it was about developing the, the dark side of things. Yeah. So this movie hit much better there because you already know the, the guardians a little bit and the villain weighed heavily on, on that team and, and on star Lord. So, um, I, also, obviously, had a ton of expectations going into this movie. I drafted it first with our second overall pick in our Rotten Tomatoes film draft. So, obviously, I had the mindset that there's no way that this movie could fail. And after seeing it, I'm happy to say that it is far from failing. You brought up kind of peeking at other uh, reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. And the consensus with the negative ones seems to be that it doesn't live up to the first one. Yeah, and, and I just think that's unfair. Yeah, that's garbage. So... Um, that being all that being said, I will say normally when I see a movie, like I'm just kind of like, Oh, I love it. I love it. And then whenever, as I get further and further removed from it, I kind of come back to reality. I'm like, Oh, well, well, this part was bad. This part part was bad. And I'm actually having the opposite effect with this movie. When I got out of the theater last night, I kind of, I, I liked it. I liked it a lot, but I, felt like it didn't quite reach my expectations and the more that I've removed myself from it and kind of thought about the plot and thought about how it kind of ties together and, and ends, I, I I'm liking it a lot more. And, okay. and I'm, and that being said, I liked it a lot when I got out. It's just, I'm, I've kind of stewed on a little bit and I'm really appreciating it a lot more. So this movie is a ton of fun. It has a ton of heart. And it's a worthy continuation of my favorite Marvel movie, which, of course, like I said, is Guardians of the Galaxy. So uh, I'm excited to talk about it with you, and I'm talk- excited to go see it again, uh, hopefully soon. For sure. So our next segment is just we're going to break down the story in a little bit more detail. Uh, for me, Baby Groot, of course, is going to be a majority of the viewers' favorite character for good reason. I thought he was well used in this movie. Um, I love the beginning dance scene. <laughs> for for a couple of different reasons. One, I, I mean, I love that song, to be honest with you. Um, and I, I thought it was kind of a cool throwback to the way the first film starts because it's a very similar... Well, the characters are kind of like dancing along to a song. Obviously, it's different than the first movie because there isn't this huge battle that's going on in the background. But I thought that was kind of a cool way to start each one of these films, if that's the idea, is that they're going to start it off with this really cool musical number. And the the character, whoever it is, is just kind of chilling and dancing. I thought that was kind of a fun way to start this movie. Um so I think a lot of people are obviously going to gravitate towards Baby Groot for good reason. But I actually thought that Peter and uh, Rocket's relationship and later Yondo or Yondu uh, relationship with actually both of Rocket and Peter were actually my favorite part of the movie. Um, like I kind of mentioned in broad strokes, these characters don't know each other in the first film. They're misfit, misfit, miss fits excuse me uh, kind of coming together so they have abrasive personalities and they don't always play well with other others so the fact that they clash at times in this film uh really makes sense to me like i really appreciated that it wasn't just like oh they're this this they they talk about being a family they constantly they like three or four times in this movie they they mention that they're a family now and families don't always get along. And so I, I think that that was a really cool thing that they did was that it's a 
you don't really see them necessarily always get along in the first one, but they're not really a team in the first one. Yeah. They're really a team in, in this one. And so I really appreciated that they don't, they didn't always get along because families don't always get along. So, um, I feel like I connected to this movie a little bit more than the first one on an emotional level. Um, that obviously has a lot to do with the fact that there's a funeral at the end and I've gone through some personal stuff on my own end. Um, that kind of that hit me a little bit harder than I would have liked it to, <laughs> to be yeah. honest with you. Um, but I mean, that's a big part of what's part of me now. So, I mean, I think it's going to be a long time before that stuff doesn't uh, affect me like it did. But uh, I also think that it had to do with a lot with the character development in the movie. Like you find out a lot about Peter in this movie and you find out a lot about him and his family the father figures in his life yep. in this movie that i mean it just it when that moment hits it it really hits you hard um being a sequel a lot of the character work does hinge on the first one it does but i mean you get that with any sequel like it assumes that you see that you've seen the first one. Uh, so a lot of that character work is just building off the stuff that's already established in the first one. Um, so it doesn't necessarily work so well as a standalone film, but I do think that it is a movie that you could story wise kind of go in and you don't necessarily need to have seen the first one to really, uh, kind of get the bullet points, but it definitely kind of builds on the first one, uh, really well. Um, I do like that. And I, I mentioned this with Star Trek Beyond. I do like that there's a couple of scenes where they kind of pair off some people that you don't, you didn't necessarily see hang out that much in the, in the first film. And so you got to get to see their dynamic a little bit more, different characters. Um, and you kind of mentioned this a little bit. The first movie is about them coming together. This movie is definitely much more of Peter's story. There's yep. some different threads here and there, but it's really just kind of Peter's story and kind of finding out more about his heritage. And I love, like I said, in broad strokes that the villain is a big part of him, his past and it clashes with a different part of his past. And obviously I'm being vague just so I don't spoil anything. Uh, but uh, I really appreciate that because that makes that third act much more important than the whole Ronin thing was in the first movie. For sure. Uh, I mean, you covered a lot of uh, ground there. For sure. Um, the story was just so great. And I agree with you 100% that the character development and the emotional development of the story was so much deeper than the first one. And that's what I came away loving about it. I love the idea of exploring Peter further and digging into the mystery of his parentage and, uh, you know, kind of the things that go into that, that again, I won't spoil like you didn't, um, that come to kind of there in the, the third act. Uh, it's definitely the perfect balance of humor and heart. Um, the only issue that I had with all of this and, and with this movie is certain parts of it. And this is how I felt coming out of it. I, I felt like it was less significant on, the grand, like a, on a bigger scale, even though I really loved the emotional storytelling that this film explored, um, as opposed to the linear stop bad guy movie that the first one was it, for whatever reason, it just felt smaller. And, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but do you just uh, mean as, like in the Marvel cinematic universe? I don't, know, I don't because, know. Just, I was not an infinity yeah, stone or maybe I, I, I watch and I actually like that about this movie. I felt like the first movie James Gunn was told, all right, like you, we're going to let you play with these characters and put your James Gunn spin on it, but you're going to have Thanos and you're going to have an infinity stone because we need that in the big, bigger picture. And then that movie was such a success. They gave this to him and said, go nuts. And you know, he, he obviously it's no secret that egos in it and ego, the living planet is kind of a obscure, crazy character to begin with. And for sure. So they kind of let him go nuts in this movie, which I love. But when I got out of it, I just, I felt like it wasn't as significant as the first one. And as, like I said, as I've removed myself from the movie and I've thought about it, I think that the emotional storytelling that it does is a lot more significant in that regard. Uh, so my opinion is kind of changing a little bit, but that's how I felt getting out of the movie. Um, I think maybe part of it has to do with a certain thread in the movie, uh, the sovereign and that character, Aisha, uh, which are the gold people. 
Uh, they were just kind of a plot device to. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, they're just go- diverting attention from what up, what ends up being the real adversary in the whole movie. And I wish that they had fleshed those characters out a little bit more. Uh, maybe like when they were introduced and you know they're interacting with the guardians like that first act. Uh, that would have been enough to kind of solidify their purpose in the movie for me. Um, so that that left a little bit of a hollow feeling. But in the end, this movie did what every movie should do, especially in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And that's it left me not wanting it to be over. Like, sure. I just I just keep wanting to follow these characters and keep wanting to see further adventures with them and to see what their next thing is. And especially after the emotional ending of this movie, I, I just want to stay with them a little bit longer and stay with baby Groot. And the fact that it does that, um, is and it's a, this movie's like what two and a half hours long, if not a long. little less than that. I think so. I mean, the fact that I was wanting more, yeah, is is pretty impressive. And you know, it carries over the first Guardian's footsteps in making you know the most fun characters and the most fun storyline that we've seen in in Marvel so far, in my opinion. So obviously, a lot of love for this movie coming from me. Obviously, we're not going to spoil anything, but I just thought it was a little odd for a film that has the most stingers I think I've ever seen <laughs> after a movie. They don't move anything as far because Marvel has kind of made it a point to kind of move the Marvel Cinematic Universe a little bit with the stingers. Yeah. Like you get like pieces of, okay, this is what's coming next. That's not what they did in this movie. I mean, they, they do have one that kind of teases a new character for volume three. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess, but I mean, they had five and I mean, (laughs) I liked what they did. I thought they were funny, but they didn't really do what the Marvel cinematic universe stingers usually do. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I thought that, there might be something infinity war related, but yeah. I'm, I'm almost glad that it, there wasn't. I love, I like that this movie stand on stands on its own. Um, you know, uh, you get a little bit of earth in this movie and I don't think that's too big of a spoiler because it's the first act you, you are a flashback on earth with, um, Peter's parents. And I like, I mean, it would have been easy to sl- slip an Avenger cameo in there or something. Sure. Uh, and I love that this movie and the grand, grand scheme of this big Marvel Cinematic Universe stands on its own and is only connected to Guardians of the Galaxy. So um, I'm surprised that they didn't set anything up in the Stingers, but the one that they did set up for uh, Volume 3 it was pretty dope. So Yeah, I'm pretty and excited And then the about others, it. others were really funny and cute, too. Yeah, so. for sure. So our next segment uh, as part of this review is just called Performances. So... First thing that stands out to me is Vin Diesel's voice work is pitch perfect. (laughs) I'm obviously kidding. I honestly forgot that it was even him until the credits rolled. How pissed is he, right? Like, at that point, why even go do it if they're just going to change what your voice sounds like? Anybody could have done the I Am Groots. I mean, anybody could have done it the first. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's true. I mean, he's getting a ton of money, man. He had to be. But anyways... I, I kind of made that joke at the at the start because I wanted to talk about how much I love Bradley Cooper as Rocket. I yeah. think he's really, really good. He's kind of that perfect mix. Like people forget that he did have like a lot of his earlier stuff. Bradley Cooper, he was in Wedding Crashers. He was in yeah. Hangover. Like he has comedic timing, and I think that even though he's only doing the voiceover work, that still takes some comedic timing. Uh, so I thought he did a really good job. Uh, one thing that I don't know if everybody knows, but actually Rocket is done by Sean, Sean Gunn. Gunn. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the cooler director's commentaries that I've ever watched was Guardians of the Galaxy. And they talk a lot about some of the lines that Bradley Cooper actually ends up saying in the original. I don't know how, how much... Uh, in the second one was like this. But uh, in the first one, a lot of it was because Sean... And we're on the first name basis now, but uh, he improved at at the time when they were rehearsing, and they liked it so much they just put put it as part of the script. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of that stuff was him doing the mocap that, for Rocket. That's pretty cool. But then again, if you're that guy, you're a little pissed off that. But you're still in the Marvel Cinematic yeah. Universe now. Yeah. I mean, he gets to play a completely other character that kind of steps up in this movie uh, and is in it a little bit more too. So. 
I mean, you got that as compensation, but you feel like you probably put all the work into Rocket, and then Bradley Cooper comes in and lays his charm down. And I don't think, as a brother, you would <laughs> think that. Like you, you were, you were a part of this success for your brother. For sure. I mean, I understand that. But uh, okay, so back to performances. I love Chris Pratt. He has charisma for days, but unfortunately, uh, as we've talked with the story. He's asked to do a little bit more of the dramatic stuff in this movie, and I think that, unfortunately, we got some of the Jurassic World Chris Pratt uh-huh. in this movie at times, which was uh, disappointing. I think, obviously, he's much more of a comedic actor. I think he does have some dramatic chops, but it was a little awkward at times. Like, he's not the best, but uh, I think he he's serviceable, but... Yeah, there was a couple of awkward moments that I'm just like, eh, that's not the best acting. I didn't notice anything that kind of caught me off guard, but I mean, yeah, his range isn't amazing. I mean, he's much more of a comedic talent, and so that kind of shows why we haven't seen him in a lot of uh, dramatic roles. For sure. Uh, was he good in Passengers? I mean, he was serviceable. I yeah. guess that movie is more, definitely more dramatic than anything he's done. But that movie was such garbage that, yeah. in my opinion, I know there there are people that love it, but uh, I just nothing stood out as being bad. Yeah, uh, the one character that I thought was surprising that they used more in this movie than they did in the first one because I don't think he's a very good actor is uh, Drax because Dave the the what, Dave, Dave Batista. Batista. I don't know why I can't talk tonight. Uh, he was definitely asked to do a lot more in this movie uh, to mix results. I thought, to be honest with you, I was surprised at how well he did, but there was definitely moments where the and it may have just been the material. Like you, he had I I don't I didn't count the jokes, but let's just hypothetically he had thirty jokes throughout this movie. I think maybe 15 of them actually hit with me and maybe some of that's the joke because it's not a good joke or maybe it's because of its perf- his performance. But there was definitely – I didn't like the nipples thing. I didn't think that that was a funny joke. Dude, I thought you're that such was- a fucking buzzkill. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that that was a really like easy joke to make. Yeah, and it was fucking hilarious. <laughs> I did not think it was funny well, at all. Th- so what the setup for that joke was just like, haha, whatever. But then the payoff for that joke. No, the payoff was dumb. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that payoff was dumb and it was like 45 minutes later. I know, but I, I, I loved it so much. I really did. The first joke wasn't bad. The first nipple joke, like it was really kind of one off. Like I kind of smiled at it and then kind of moved on. And the second one, I was just like, that was really dumb. Why did they go back to that? Even thinking of it is like making me tear up a little bit. <laughs> You're so fucking dumb. <laughs> um. No, you're being a buzzkill with these performances. I thought what's great about the performances in this movie is that all the returning. I said I liked Bradley Cooper. Yeah, I mean all the perf- like the perf- the people that came back. So like the people that were in the first movie. I thought that they're all a little bit more comfortable with their roles, and then you add on to that with the new characters. So I thought, I mean, Kurt Russell didn't do anything too crazy as ego, but I mean he was just kind of Kurt Russell about it. But I mean he wasn't bad. But I thought that um, Palm. And I'm going to fuck her last name up. Uh, Clementife, uh, who played Mantis. I yeah. thought she was perfect. Uh, she was great. And then, you know, Michael Rooker, I thought, really stepped up as Yondu. He was asked to do a lot more in this movie as well, um, as Chris Pratt was. A lot more emotional stuff. And I thought that he pulled it off uh, really great. And that everybody that came back was great, too. I, I'm kind of... I don't know that Dave Bautista is a great actor because I haven't really seen him in anything except for where he's just kind of a robot in this movie without emotion. But, I mean, he was definitely the comedic relief uh, for most of his scenes, and I I thought it it hit more than it it didn't, So, especially the nipples. (laughs) I hated that joke so much. I was like, I even thought to myself, I was like, you're better than that. (laughs) Not Dave Bautista. He's definitely not better than that. But, I mean, James Gunn, like, you're better than that joke. There's a part in the movie, and I don't. I guess it could kind of be tied into performances, and I'm kind of curious your opinion on it. Uh, Groot says, I am Groot to Yondu. And Yandu asked Rocket what he said, and he goes, he said you're in the frickin' Guardians of the Galaxy, only he didn't use frickin'. And that's in the trailer, so that's not that big of a a spoiler. Do you think that in the original script, James Gunn tried to sneak a fuck in 
And then Disney was like, whoa, 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 no. Because you're allowed to say fuck once in a PG-13 movie. And they could have been the first Marvel movie to say fuck. No, I don't think so. Because I think it's funnier the way that they did you it. You do? Yeah. I thought maybe he tried to sneak a fuck in and Kevin Feige was like, nah, bro, we can't do that. Let's stop saying sneak a fuck in. <laughs> 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 All right. So uh, 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 unless you had more for performances. No, I just I didn't have any complaints like you. I didn't complain the entire time. <laughs> Anyways, uh, the next segment, and I guess the last segment uh, we'll do for this review is action. For me, there was something for everything, or for every fan in this movie. I mean, there was gunfights, there were space battles, there were fist fights. I love that you got to see Rocket do a little bit more hand-to-hand in yeah, the first was awesome. film. You kind of just see him using guns and gadgets and I thought it was really really cool uh that you got to see him do a little bit more fist fights and i the a character literally says oh you don't have any more gadgets and then he just whoops his ass yeah so i thought that was pretty cool and i thought the the scene leading up to that was really cool because you kind of got to see a, a weird like home alone type of thing <laughs> but then when push comes to shove he can still kick your ass so yep. i thought that was really really cool uh yondu has a uh a really like extended arrow action scene that i thought was really well done um what was that song that was playing i forget uh, I, I can't remember uh it was about jose so it was that I have the soundtrack as do I. And I don't yeah, know. Um, it was something that some girl has a boyfriend named Jose. Anyways, I thought while I was listening to the, the soundtrack, I thought before the movie came out, I was like, how's this song going to play into the movie? Cause James Gunn does a really good job on that, especially in the first movie and in this movie as well of picking songs that kind of fit what's happening in the movie. And I actually thought, that that song really fit. Um, Not so much when I was just listening before I saw the movie. I was kind of curious how they were going to fit that one in. But I think given the situation, I thought that uh, song really did fit uh, quite well. And the scene was really cool. Uh, That being said, I hate to end this segment, at least for my part, on a negative. But uh, Peter's fight at the end was uh, pretty lame. I didn't really like it. It felt like... Man of Steel, kind of like disaster porn, like they're just punching each other through a bunch of shit. Oh, yeah. So I was a little bit disappointed in that. Yeah, I don't, I agree. I don't think that that felt very Guardians esque. Yeah. I, it felt, it felt, di- that maybe it just didn't feel in place. So I agreed with that. But for the most part, I thought the action in this movie was a lot of fun. Um, you mentioned the opening credit scene, um, earlier and, I thought that scene was amazing and it was incredibly shot. It's, you know, focused on Groot and you just get, see the action in the background while he's dancing and doing whatever baby Groot does. And I, I thought that that took a lot of talent to kind of shoot it like that. Um, the final act, like you said, uh, I felt the same way, but I thought that the other characters, what they had going on was kind of cool. Um, each character had something they're doing and I really f- felt like there was a sense of peril. So I did like that aspect of it. Uh, the, the one exceptional scene, that I wanted to bring up that you also brought up was rockets uh, scene with the, the, the ravagers. Uh, it's just picking them off them off from the trees with his gadgets. And then also, like you said, hand to hand was just a lot of fun and really great and something that we didn't see from him in the first movie. So it was cool that they did something different there and showed that, you know, he's a raccoon, but he's still to be reckoned with. So for uh, sure, all in all action was a ton of fun in this movie. All right. So that's pretty much all I have for guardians of the galaxy volume two. Uh, well, what would you give it as far as star rating is concerned? I'm going to give it a four. Okay. I don't remember what I gave the first one. I, I'm sure it was a four, probably maybe even a four and a half, because I really, really love that movie. But uh, I'm going to give this one a four as well. Awesome. All right. So our last little segment that we do every episode is just called a nerd favorite. Tyler and I take turns asking a really nerdy question. The subject changes from episode to episode. It's always what your favorite, whatever the subject is. So uh, it's Tyler's turn this week. Uh, so what's nerd favorite? You mentioned that you had the, the soundtrack. Uh, yep. Volume two. And I also got it. So uh, awesome Mix Volume 2 was a big part of this movie. I believe in the first synopsis for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, it said, set to the backdrop of Awesome Mix Volume 2, and then 
goes further into it. So obviously music is a huge part of these movies and we love it for it. So I'm just curious what your favorite move, uh, <laughs> what your favorite song from volume two is. So I'll give you a sec to think and I'll go ahead with mine. Uh, mine is surrender by okay. trick. And I was listening to uh, volume two soundtrack before I saw the movie and I was so excited to see the song on there because I love this song so much. It's definitely my favorite cheap trick song. I was a little disappointed. There's that- really only like two <laughs> other options. Oh, for sure. <laughs> but out of those three, this is my favorite. Um, I was disappointed because it turns out to be just pretty much a credit song. Yeah. It's like the first song that plays in the credits. And I was hoping that, uh, you know, it deals with mommy's all right, daddy's all right. And this movie obviously explored Peter Quill's parentage a lot that it be maybe used in a bigger part of the movie. For sure. So that was disappointing, but I love the song so much and it, it did play well with the credits um, as well because the credits are very animated. Uh, not only just with the, the, the uh, fuck, what's the word? For the credits scenes, stingers, stingers, no, I, not with this, but the the credits themselves are animated as well. Um, Cheap Trick was my first concert. Oh I yeah, saw them open for Aerosmith with my dad in junior high. So that's also kind of a cool callback to that. I saw it with my dad. This movie deals a lot with daddy issues and uh, father figures, so kind of comes full circle. So that's definitely my my favorite of the album. Yeah, so I also saw Cheap Trick in concert. They opened for a journey. Did the lead singer go on like a 20-minute rant at your concert about how they're the real Cheap Trick and then there's like apparently imposters out there? No, that's weird. It was super, super weird and it brought the whole show down. But anyways, that's fuck? actually one of the few things I remember from their performance was oh just that God. he went on a weird rant about it. But anyways, um, yeah, um, that's a good song. One of their only good songs. I really am not a huge cheap for, trick fan. But anyways, um, one of my um, or my favorite song from Awesome Mix Volume 2 is The Chain from Fleetwood Mac. I actually forgot how much I love that song. It's such a fantastic song. I actually, my wife is obsessed with the voice and I was been listening to that song so much recently i thought to myself like it's starting to seep into my brain because i'm constantly seeing her watch that show i swear to god that show's on every goddamn night (laughs) as much as she watches it i was like why does it more people do that song like it would be a perfect song to kind of showcase what you do that's how much she watches that (laughs) show is it that it started to seep into my brain but uh yeah, I just really love that song. Unfortunately, I don't think it's used very well. It may have been used later in the film if I – I may have missed it. But uh, oh, the only time I remember hearing it is they their ship crashes at one point and Rock is fixing it. And it's just kind of like playing in the background of him fixing the ship. So I was a little bit disappointed with that because it's such a powerful song. And I thought it could have been used a little bit better yeah. in this film. But – he does such a good job with most of the other songs. It's kind of weird that we picked the two that don't really like feed into <laughs> the into the uh, movie that much. I do like uh, Blue Sky or Mister Blue Sky mm-hmm. from Electric Light Orchestra. I think is what the the band is that sings that song, uh, and that's the song that Baby Groot sings or sings uh, dances to at the very beginning. So that would definitely be a close second. But I love the chains that song in general so much more uh, that I, I ha- kind of have to go with that one. Cool. All right, so that's it for episode uh, 139 of the Nerds You're Looking For podcast. As always, we really appreciate it. You follow us on Twitter and Instagram. They're both at the Nerds Podcast. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Google+. Plus. Vote for us for Podcast of the Month at podcastland.com. You can also comment and subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Nerds You're Looking For. Check out our new Twitch channel, which Tyler does a weekly stream every Monday at 9 p.m. Central. We'd also appreciate if you subscribe, rate, review us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, basically any good podcatcher you use. We're on it. You can also email us at the nerds you're looking for at gmail.com. For Patrick Kuhn, Tyler Hunt, we are the nerds you're looking for. Take it easy, guys. Later, guys. <laughs>